following program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. She's got the news. She talks with newsmakers. She encourages us to laugh. And she cries with us. Speaking truth to power and questioning authority daily, it's the Nicole Sandler Show. All right. Welcome to a Tuesday. I I hate saying it's Tuesday because then I have to say, and gotta laugh is still not back. Uh, Laffy is dealing with something, a health issue with her hands, and she's working on it, and hopefully she'll be back with us before too long. But uh, we have a great fill-in for her today. The FOIA terrorist himself, Jason Leopold, will be joining us a little later in the hour. Um, And actually, I had just, uh, you know, I realized it had been a while since Jason was on the program. And I, over the weekend, just shot him a message. I said, hey, how about coming on with me uh, this week? And he said, yeah, I can do Tuesday. Tuesday's great. And it turns out, go figure, um, early this morning, a, a huge story courtesy of Jason Leopold breaks and it has to do with the fact that he's the FOIA terrorist and I say that in a loving way because uh, I think it was the Bush administration who dubbed him the FOIA terrorist and he did the smart thing he's like okay I'll take it and so from now on from here on out he embraces the handle so um, uh, it sticks and stones and all that stuff so he is the FOIA terrorist and you know, screw you George W. Bush and your administration. Somebody else I'd like to say that to in a in a more um, a blunt manner is Rick Santorum. Now I mentioned this the other day after he uh, his his comments at this Young America's Foundation talk uh, were made public, where he talked about you know we came and founded this country and there was nothing here; it was a blank slate. Oh, I know there were Native Americans, but you know, frankly. They don't matter. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he said. And that was about a week ago. And Rick Santorum had been absent from the CNN airwaves ever since. Now, uh, that's uh, notable because Rick Santorum is a paid contributor at CNN. So, yeah, when they say someone is a contributor um, or an analyst, that means they are paid by the network. So they will show up and um, you know, it's not they're not just a guest. They're paid to be on so many times a year or as often as they want them. But nobody um, wanted Rick Santorum, apparently, on CNN after this. In fact, even after um, uh, the not State of the Union address the other night, um, it, it, uh, CNN was notable in the fact that, thank you, Rick Santorum was not there. Now, we did have Van Jones and. Uh, whoever else they had on. So it kind of made up for it. But, you know, at least we didn't have Rick Santorum. That changed last night. And I flipped on the TV, and there he is on with Chris Cuomo. So I want to play for you a little bit. Um, I'm not going to play much of it because, frankly, the segment sickened me. Um, But to listen to Rick Santorum's uh, fumfering and how he tried to get out of it and just couldn't. And after that, I'm going to play for you a little bit of Don Lemon when he came on a couple hours later and basically not only let Rick Santorum have it in absentia, but also Chris Cuomo, too, for having that fucker on the air. All right. Sorry. It pissed me off, too. I'm right there with Don Lemon. So here is um, a few seconds of what the idiot Santorum, Google it, uh, said And then Chris Cuomo trying to get an explanation out of him. Created a blank slate. We 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 created a nation from nothing. I mean, there's nothing nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but but candidly, that that there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. (laughs) Really? No, I cut it down. Right. Two problems. One. It's not accurate. There is Mm -hmm. a lot of affect from the native culture on America. Um, And there are a lot of people here who believe in that. And this seemed like you were trying to erase diversity in the interest of some white Christian right. 
No, 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 no. Just, just to be clear, what I was not saying is really? the Native American culture. I, I, I misspoke. I was, I was saying in the, what I was talking about <laughs> is, as you can see from the run-up, I was talking about the founding of our country. I, I'd given a long talk about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence <laughs> and the ideas behind those, and that that no? that that, and I, and I was saying we sort of created that anew, if you will. What? And, no. And I was I was not trying to dismiss no. Native Americans. In fact, no. I mentioned it because yes. They were here, and they did have an impact. In fact, <laughs> in this country, you're right. They have a huge impact, particularly in the West oh, and many really? other areas of the country, mm. where they have a huge impact on American uh -huh. culture. I uh -huh. was talking about, and I misspoke in this respect, uh -huh. I was talking about the founding oh, and the, the principles founding. embodied in the founding. Uh -huh. I would never, and you know, people have said, oh, I'm trying to you know, dismiss what we did to the Native yeah. Americans. Far from it. Oh, no. Uh, the way we treated Native Americans was horrific. Yeah. Uh, it goes against every bone and everything I've ever fought really? for uh, as, as, a, as a leader in, in, in the Congress. I believe, as, the, as our founding document says, that we are endowed by a creator with unalienable rights and that we are all equal. Really? And, and, and when we treat people as other yeah. or less than human, yeah. that's when America, that's when every country gets into problem. We did it with the Native Americans. What? We did it with, with respect to African Americans. I believe what? we're doing it with, with children in the womb today. Wait, wait, wait. So wait. This is with, with children in the womb? Real, is, that, is that physically possible? Children in the womb? Are you talking about fetuses? Because fetuses ain't children. Children, I know I'm. It's sort of. Uh, uh, it's off the point. But I. Every time I listen to this clip, that jumps out at me, and I had to say it. Fuck you, Santorum. So you hear the word salad there, right? I, I'm not going to play any more of that. You, you heard, heard the, the pertinent point. point. He had nothing. He had nothing to say. And Chris Cuomo, sorry, wasn't a whole lot better. So enter Don Lemon. Ooh, enter Don Lemon because Don Lemon was having none of it. Absolutely none of it. All right, so you go, Don Lemon. I was furious watching the interview in my office. I cannot believe the first words out of his mouth weren't, I'm sorry, I yep. said something ignorant. Yep. I, you know, I, sh I need to learn about the history of this country. No contrition, didn't talk about you know, the suffering that Native Americans <laughs> have had to deal with Nothing. in this country. It was, I mean, R Rick Santorum, really? Really. Who, did he think, did he actually think it was a good idea for him to come on television <laughs> and try to whitewash the whitewash that he whitewashed? I mean, boom. it was, it was horrible. It was. It was horrible and insulting, and I apologize to the viewers who were insulted by it because I was sitting in my office furious. Good for you. Because he's done Me it too. so many times. Yep. So many times. And it's just, I'm sorry. It was just, it, it was so egregious and insulting and everything that we talk about, about the founding of this country. <laughs> Europeans did not found, found Thank you. this country. No, they didn't. It was here. The Native Americans had this country before the Europeans came. Yeah, yeah. the Europeans conquered the country. They colonized it, but they didn't. They, they, it was it had nothing to do with the founding of this country. And he should recognize that. He needs to know that, especially if he's going to be on television, representing us and talking oh, about shit. it. He should be doing it from the right perspective, and not from some perspective about how. You know what Europeans? No, that, that's the wrong way to look at it. That is the he is he's. It's all wrong. Yep. I'm sorry, but that is. You don't the have truth. to apologize, Don. I, I I can't believe I just I was watching it going. I cannot believe this man is sitting here and doing this. It was like the for Black Lives Matter. It was like Native American Lives Matter moment for me watching that. All right, I you did have edit this. Here we go. Because people believe that America was founded in the image of white people and that the country was built in their image and therefore the election should go their way. It's the same thing that Rick Santorum is saying about Native Americans yep. and the lack of the contribution what have you. It's the same thing. I think people know that. I just think people are tired of being insulted every single day. 70% of that, that party accepts that doesn't the big lie right that doesn't make it right and that nope. doesn't of mean of course that it doesn't make it right what i'm saying is if it, it were as simple as two plus two equals four it's we wouldn't not, be in this situation it's not that uh, listen we're not getting you're not getting anywhere because i seriously i'm just i'm, I'm i know really you're mad. upset I'm what really i'm saying mad. is rightly so what's the solution what's the fix if it were as simple as he's wrong you're right we wouldn't be here that's all we got to go because we're not going to agree. Not I agree agree. because I know where you're coming from and I love you, Don Lennon. Yeah, I love you too. We agree on just... the problem. What's the solution? We got to figure it out. 
<laughs> I got a big, th- I got a solution, but anyways, not my decision. I got a solution, but not my decision. The solution would be, number one, get Rick Santorum off of CNN's air. That's what Don Lemon is saying. It's not my call. He has no say in who is a paid contributor and who isn't. But I would think that those comments made by Rick Santorum would disqualify him from that position. There are plenty of other failed Republican candidates for office who they can hire as a contributor. MSNBC has a boatload of them. And why is it? It's always the the Republicans who lose re-election they hire on as, as contributors. What? Do, do, does what Rick Santorum or Carlos Curbelo have to say make any difference to anybody anywhere? No. All right. I had to play that because... Thank you, Don Lemon. I cut out most of what Chris Cuomo said because, frankly, he was infuriating, too. I mean, when I first saw Santorum on there and I David in the other room going, is that Rick Santorum? And I said, yeah, Chris Cuomo's giving him the opportunity to rehabilitate himself. What the fuck? You know, there's only so many hours a day that they have, you know, airtime and they waste it on people like that. I wonder what happens if uh, if it still works. If you Google Santorum, because um, back about ten years ago, if you Googled Santorum, um, uh, the fir- the first or second thing that comes up, well, now it's one, two, three, four, five. Well, now it's the fifth entry. If you Google Santorum, and the one entry that simply says Santorum gives you the definition of Santorum. The frothy mix of lube and fecal matter that is sometimes the byproduct of anal sex. The second definition of Santorum is Senator Rick Santorum. Never did a, and this is pre-meme, I mean, this uh, is something that, uh, oh God, what's his name? I, I can, uh, Dan Savage did because Rick Santorum likened homosexuality to bestiality. I mean, he's just a, he's a, he's a just a horrible excuse for a human being. CNN, fire his ass. The, the American people did. The people of Pennsylvania fired him years ago. You keep paying him to smear Native Americans? Whew. Okay, how to get that out. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's Tuesday, everybody. Um, There is some breaking news, and this has to do with the interview coming up with Jason Leopold. And just so you know, we recorded that a couple hours ago because Jason had to leave to go get his second Moderna vaccine. So he will be all inoculated following today. So he's not available now. So we taped this a couple hours ago. This story broke after we finished taping our interview. And I'm just going to read it to you because uh, it's fascinating. A federal judge has ordered the Department of Justice to release a March 2019 legal memo clearing former president, you know, the former guy of potential obstruction of justice charges following the Mueller investigation with the judge accusing former Attorney General Bill Barr and agency lawyers of deceiving the public. Ah! Yeah, uh, maybe I should play this. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> yeah. oh. District Judge Amy, Brennan, Amy Berman Jackson yesterday ordered the DOJ to release the legal memo within two weeks in response to a FOIA lawsuit filed by Crew, the watchdog group Citizens for Ethics and Responsibility in Washington. The DOJ had argued in court that the full memo, portions of which have already been released, should be withheld because it falls under exceptions to public records law for attorney-client privilege and deliberative government decision-making. But the judge said yesterday that those claims were not consistent with her own review of uh, of the unredacted memo or the timeline revealed by internal emails among top Justice Department officials. Jackson, who was appointed to the federal district court in D.C. by Obama, wrote in a scathing 41 page decision that, quote, not only was the attorney general being disingenuous then, But DOJ has been disingenuous to this court with respect to the existence of a decision making process that should be shielded by the deliberative process privilege. End quote. Oh, no. And she continues. Sorry, there's more. 
the agency's oh, hold on uh, hold on one second I, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to this the agency's redaction and incomplete explanations obfuscate the true purpose of the memorandum and the excised portions belie the notion that it fell to the attorney general to make a prosecutorial decision or that any such decision was on the table at any time so she ordered this memo be released due to Cruz for your request. Jason will come on to talk about a whole cache of documents that he received, uh, I guess, late yesterday um, from his own for your request from the Mueller investigation. Interesting, huh? All right, real quickly, uh, Tamara on the line. Hi, what's up? Hey, Nicole, I, uh, the day before Santorum did his interview, Ron Reagan came out with a new commercial from the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and let me tell you, I ignored it. And then the next day I saw Santorum's ad, or BS, and I immediately went online and gave $10 to the Freedom <laughs> From Religion Foundation. Okay, well, this one has nothing to do with the other, but I got you. All right, Tamara, I got to run because I, I got this interview with Jason Leopold, and it's it's fairly lengthy, so I don't want to miss a beat. So um, I, I think I'm giving us enough time, so we'll get it in before the end of the hour. Um, uh, so with that in mind, the fact that uh, the judge ordered this memo uh, about Bill Barr's misleading the public um <laughs> on uh you know on on Trump's liability here um it, again it's related so with no further ado that sort of snowballs into this and we welcome Jason Leopold back to the show via tape from today. All right. Joining us on the line now is our old friend Jason Leopold, of course, a senior investigative reporter for BuzzFeed News. And Jason, once again, you got another scoop. Your FOIA skills uh, just are overwhelming. And so what, tell us what this latest uh, batch sure. of documents you got is. Our, our. And you got me at a good time, Nicole. We spoke over the weekend and I wasn't expecting these records. So uh, we have we have something to talk about today. Yes, I, I, I know because it had been a while and I thought, yeah. you know what, let's get Jason on just to check in, see how things are going. Yeah. And so we, we made it, we booked to do it today. And I wake up this morning to a big story from you and Anthony at, at BuzzFeed News about uh, another FOIA trove that came in. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, we'll have to do that again. You'll have to. So I. So this may be the way I get documents now is by you reaching <laughs> out to me, me agreeing to speak with you just as a story breaks. There you go. Uh, so these are documents that I have been going after for a number of years from the Mueller investigation. And, you know, as you know, I had uh, had uh, unredacted helped to unredact the Mueller report. I had pried loose hundreds of page, uh, thousands of pages of the interview summaries, the FBI interview summaries known as 302s um, from subjects and, and, and people who were targets of the investigation. Um, and frankly, I've gone after every single document that Mueller, you know, uh, that his team had collected during the course of their investigation. Mm-hmm. So these are the uh, what, what can be considered the supplemental material that goes along with these FBI 302s. This is, you know, the emails, the text messages, the memos um, that uh, people like Mike Flynn, Paul Manafort, Ivanka Trump, Jared Kushner, these are the, the, the you know, the, their, their personal communications that they had written um during the campaign and and even while you know they were uh, just getting into the white house in 2017 um so this is sort of like the the this is what Mueller scooped up um during the course of his investigation but they're incredible you know and they're incredible because it is you know really getting an idea of what happened you know, in that during that campaign, and people may think they know, oh, I know everything that happened, but they don't because we don't, you know, we didn't get an opportunity to see all of this, you know, uh, all of these communications. We did not get an opportunity to, you know, to look at 
all of the evidence that that Mueller collected. And so while the records pertain to a, a period of time, a period in time uh, that dates back to 2015 and 2016, they're still very newsworthy. Oh, sure. You know? And uh, so this is about 300 pages of, uh, of documents that they turned over. It'll be, again, the first, you know, the, the first batch that will, you know, we'll start getting every month. Um, who knows how long they have thousands and thousands oh, wow. of, uh, of pages that they're turning over. But it gives us real insight, again, you know, into the campaign. Um, lots of discussion about Russia. Oh, yeah. You know, what I find really fascinating about this, and, and I'm coming at this from, you know, an observer, a journalist, obviously. But what's fascinating about this is that you have to look at this through the eyes of, you know, maybe the FBI. Why, why was the FBI targeting the Trump campaign? Why? Why did they target them? Well, you know, some of these records may provide some people with answers. You know, some people who believe, you know, nefarious activities were taking place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what we kind of honed in on and memorialized in our story, laid bare in our story, were, you know, emails from Mike Flynn where, you know, uh, Paul Manafort had just reached out. Paul Manafort, who had been fired from the campaign as campaign manager, he reached out to Mike Flynn and his deputy national security advisor, KT McFarlane, just right. five days before Trump was inaugurated. Uh, wanted to share some information. Yeah. About, uh, that, uh, that he gathered from his travels. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, you know, KT McFarlane sends an email to Mike Flynn saying, should we meet with him given all that's going on? And Mike Flynn says, it's unclear who he's working for right now. Let's wait until we're in the hot seats. Right. You know? And that was talking um, about, was that talking about Steve Bannon or Paul Manafort? Who, uh, who he's working for? I don't think he was referring to who he's working for as, as Steve Bannon or Paul Manafort. I think it may have more to do who he's working for in terms of who his for, who who he's connected to, like foreign, either foreign governments, foreign leaders. Um, that's more or less. Okay. What I, All right. I think he's referring to. I got you. So you know, then you have a you know email, an email from um, uh, from. Oh, oh, there's also excuse me. There's also text messages. We get to see the text messages uh, related to. Mike Flynn's communications with the former Russian ambassador to the U.S., Sergei Kislyak. Kislyak, right. It was the, you know, his, those communications were the catalyst for his ouster, uh, for, for being, you know, uh, lying to Mike Pence and being fired. Uh, you can see this sort of effort by, you know, by Mike Flynn to sort of contain the fallout from that as the media started asking questions. Um, there's, you know, there, there, there are emails from George Papadopoulos saying, right. you know, Russian outreach. Here's some, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's some questions. Some people want to, uh, you know, meet with, uh, with Trump in Russia. Um, there is, uh, something from Roger Stone, yep. uh, to Steve Bannon, which, which did come out, um, during his trial, but there's a little bit more context here about, Hey, I know, I know how we can win this. Uh, this was in August 2016, but it ain't it, it, right. It ain't, it ain't going to be easy or something yeah. like that, right? Uh, there's uh, some you know emails from you know from uh, Jared Kushner about a secret meetings with Henry Kissinger. Yeah, that uh, that was kind of weird. I mean, a lot of this stuff is is eyebrow raising. Henry Kissinger was what? What the hell was Henry Kissinger doing meeting with them? Um, it, you know, a lot of questions that that. that make you go whoa where did that come um, from yeah yeah no and that's exactly it so it's uh to me these are you know th these are great historical records they really help you know for those uh, individuals who, who continue to follow you know what happened what went on what was happening taking place behind the scenes it's um it's it's intriguing you know, it adds to the intrigue. It is. Uh, there was one. I, I I don't know if it's in the story or I just saw you tweeted it. Um, Ivanka is in there as well. Yeah. And at one point, she's she's she mentioned someone's name, 
and that's spelled P-H something, and she had to explain that the P-H is pronounced like an F? Right. <laughs> what? Really? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. J- j- just seeing her writing this stuff in in a somewhat official capacity is is a bit off putting. Uh, knowing yeah, what we know about Ivanka sense, Trump, you really do get the sense from you know. I mean, she's even recommending, um, you know, as they're bringing people onto the campaign, she's she's saying that Don Jr. that who she's copying on a on an email, he can help with military advisors to <laughs> you know bring in some military. Civilian you know, military advisors. advisors. Civilian military advisors. Yeah. And really, you know, why? Um, How? Right. So it's it's fascinating. It's uh, it, it's it, it really kind of you know g- gives deeper insight into what was happening, and there really is a lot discussed here about Russia. Um, there's no smoking gun. Right. There is, you know, but but the, but there, you know, there are. Uh, lots of questions that that one would understand that that would be asked, you know, about this and and, and about what they were doing, you know. Um, so it's uh, to me, it's just fascinating. It's uh, um, you know, everyone who's you know who's sort of mentioned in these you know emails, most of them at least, you know, George Papadopoulos, mm-hmm. Roger Stone, um, Mike Flynn, um, charged with crimes pardoned by trump uh you get a sense of their you know deep involvement in the campaign advising the campaign um so it's it's uh you know the, the, these are valuable records important records so it's uh it, it's been great to have this opportunity to kind of you know continue that reporting because uh you know i think that one of the things about Mueller and his re- his report is that you don't really get a sense of you know, to me at least, all the the sort of, all of the communications, you know, that were taking place. I mean, he obviously was tasked with investigating specific, you know, potential crimes. Um, But, uh, you know, to kind of get this, this, this deeper understanding of what was being discussed, you know, at the time is, uh, is fascinating. It's also fascinating because I haven't seen it anywhere, but there's an email from um, from Mike Flynn yeah. to Corey Lewinowski, right? Uh, where he uh, shares a news story from uh, Russia state-run media Sputnik News uh, with uh-huh. Corey Lewinowski, and, and where Mike Flynn is quoted in this story, and the story is about how the U.S. needs to engage. Russia and Arab countries uh, to defeat ISIL. Right. But in this email, he he says this is very important. You need to read this. And he says, "Hey, by the way, I um, I met with Putin. Right. I had dinner know, with them. <laughs> I had dinner. With, in fact, I sat with him at dinner. And we know that we saw the picture. Know, right. Yeah, we saw the picture. But this is the first time to get Flynn." discuss that in his own words right you know, in his own words not where he's speaking to the media um but in an email where he's talking about an email he, he he you know he ends his email with merry christmas <laughs> um you know signs off flynn i mean so there's just you know you, you kind of almost in, in some ways feel like a fly on the wall right so so jason you said you you had no idea that this all these um, uh, this this group of documents was coming your way today. It's, so you you do these FOIA requests at any given time. How many do you have out there? Thousands, Nicole. Oh, I mean, I'm up to. I mean, I have thousands of FOIA requests, and I have well over eighty lawsuits against the government. Wow. So so, yeah. so then that you just something shows up in your mailbox one day. Is that how it works? Normally, they're supposed to on the lawsuit. So we sued for these. Okay. And you know, they're supposed to have a, you know, a date where they agree to produce the record. They may have, like, agreed to do it. I just, you know, lost track of time. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's hard to keep up with. What month are we in? Right, so, right. Um, you know, it's the first, it's the first uh, uh, business day in May. They, okay. They clearly turned something over, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't expecting it. Right. So uh, then you said this, this bunch was 300 pages but you said this, this is going to go like the last one did where you, every month you get another batch of 
documents. So yeah. what was the request for on this one? Was it any information pertaining to the what? Ha, what ha, like yeah. what what was the request for this? I, I asked the government to provide me with every document that that Mueller collected. Oh, wow. Uh, in the course of his investigation. <laughs> They wow. had said that the records I asked for, I think, were, you know, amounted to like 19 billion pages. Something They, they used the word billion in there. Something oh ludicrous. Oh, my God. Um, you know, they said that the records that Mueller collected were, you know, that, that surpassed what is being held at the National Archives. Um, I don't believe them on that. But on, mm-hmm. on, on these particular records, you know, this is um, what uh, the, the sort of attachments and supplemental material that went along with all of the interviews FBI agents had conducted with subjects and witnesses in the Mueller investigation. And there were hundreds of witnesses and subjects in the investigation. So perhaps they subpoenaed many records or there was just a document preservation order. People were forced to turn over emails. Um, you know, related to the scope of the investigation, which is, you know, Russia, was there, was there any, you know, uh, collusion with, um, you know, between the campaign and Russia. So that's what these records sort of, uh, make up. And, um, yeah, my goal is to, is to, you know, in, in, in the course of however long it takes is, is to kind of help set a, a, or, or a, a different narrative than or an expanded narrative than the one that um you know we've seen in 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 Mueller's report right you know a, a few questions here um Mueller's report i i got it um let me see if i can't find this oh shoot uh and and i let I'll, you know what i'll come back to that in a second yeah. the other news story i woke up to today was a story about um christopher Steele did a second dossier for the FBI on Trump that was compiled while he was in office. Do you know about this? I, I have to say, I don't know about that, Nicole. I'm, I'm immediately questioning the veracity of it. I haven't seen any sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know who the, the, the times of London sources are. Right. Um, I don't know anything about that. Okay. I mean, I find it, I, I, I find it hard to believe. I'm a bit skeptical of it, to be honest with you. That's my that's my initial reaction. Okay. Uh, I haven't I haven't seen anything like that. And you know, at that time, it's just odd because what we do know from the from the sort of public reporting, and that's even the investigations that have taken place, is that you know once Steele went to journalists, you know, just some months earlier. Uh, to disclose information in, in, in his dossier, which BuzzFeed News uh, published, mm-hmm. um, the FBI cut him off. So he was, in, in some ways, persona non grata, you know, at, at the Bureau. So the fact that he supposedly worked on a second one, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know where that comes from or, or who's making that claim. Okay. But, um yeah. Yeah, because that I, I saw that. It's like, whoa! With the, the, if if this is true, uh, right. that changes a lot, doesn't it? I mean, if the FBI yeah. was working with Steele after Trump was in office, that that turns all the um, uh, the the doubt about the first one on its head, yeah. doesn't it? Wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's 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 strange. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I think the thing about Steele that people should not forget is that, you know, he had been working for the U.S. government, a number of different agencies um, for many, many years and had provided um, dossiers or reports to the State Department, um, clearly on issues that where, where he has expertise like Russia and, and um, uh, you know, uh, other, I think, Ukraine as well. So he had... Um, he had been providing this, so but, the, but doing it after Trump was inaugurated, um, that just seems odd to me. Right? No, no, to me too. So, so we're saying that you're saying that the, 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 you, the, let's get more information on this because they're not not necessarily take it at face value. Yeah, and there's no one that's um, you know as far as the sources are concerned. It's you know it's just 
it's unknown who they are. Right. Right. Um, uh, I, I hear you. Jason Leopold is with us, obviously. Uh, the senior r- reporter for BuzzFeed News, uh, the FOIA terrorist. Are they still using that terrorist descriptor, or did they, have they come up with something more creative for you? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen anything lately what, um, you know, what they refer to me as, but um, I think the terrorist <laughs> thing is, is kind of, uh, you know, I've taken ownership of that. Yes. Uh, and they don't have it anymore. Good. Yeah, it's, I guess it's like what Trump is trying to do with the big lie. <laughs> so, right. right. Yes. And how astounding is that? Have you uncovered anything in all your paperwork, Jason, about the way he does this stuff? I mean, the way he appropriated the term fake news, which was used against him to talk about the places like Fox who were, you know, who, who would come concoct these bullshit stories to benefit him and then he started using the term to his advantage now he's trying to do it again with the big lie which we all know is his lie that he won the election that that biden stole it from him this is a weird tactic this is these are psychological games have you seen any communications about this this kind of uh, psychological warfare that he embarks on I haven't. And it's funny that you mentioned like just the fake news, uh, because I remember when that became, you know, uh, uh, a maxim that that it it just appeared everywhere. And um, I did ask, I I did file requests with the government, you know, FOIA requests with the government kind of very early on um, to see if they were using that. And it just seems to have appeared. in, uh, in in various emails um, with, within you know the, the government officials were using the the the, the term fake news right um, and just you know no explanation behind it just suddenly it just you know it just appeared right uh, and uh, you know recently I actually uh, obtained some records from uh, uh, Health and Human Services when uh, Michael Caputo. Uh, was was uh, uh, put in charge of uh, public affairs there, and it was used quite a bit. Right, and and bragging about, uh, if I recall correctly, Michael Caputo bragged about how he got the CDC to change some of their verbiage, some of right. their directives based on the this the nonsense coming out of HHS. Yeah, yeah, and also what they felt was like you know the fake news media. Yeah. Um, you know, or, and I believe they even refer to it, you know, the media that way. But it is kind of amazing to kind of see the, the way in which this, that phrase, or as you noted, the, you know, the big lie. Right, that he's that trying to appropriate that. And I bring it up, Jason, because the, the, I had this Twitter exchange. So the story breaks this morning. Uh, I noticed somebody on Twitter, you know, um, tweets out telegraph font former mi6 spy produced a second trump dossier somebody responded to that tweet uh, a guy named peter krumenich i don't even know who he is but he said tin foil hats anyone Mueller investigation found no evidence to back up the claims of collaboration in Steele's first dossier so why should we waste any more time on his latest conspiracy theories And I I look at that, I'm like, you know, way to rewrite history, but this is what they do. The Mueller report didn't find nothing, but that's the way they framed it in their in their fake news world. And and that's what the Trumpers and these uh, denial reality denialists keep pushing. Um, This is a thing where that's their that's their narrative now that the Mueller investigation cleared Trump and his cronies of any wrongdoing, which couldn't be further from the truth, could it? Well, Mueller even testified that Trump was not cleared. Right. And and the the it's interesting, you know, we're we're talking about the Mueller report after it was, you know, years after it was written, but it's a, it's a, it's a monumental report. You know, it's a, this was a historic investigation. Uh-huh. And, you know, the, the fact is, is that a lot of people put their hopes. And I'm, 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 I'm a reporter, right? I just want, when I was reporting on this, uh, I, I just wanted to get some, you know, information to report, but people just give me some hopes. truth, man. Give me yeah. some truth. To quote exactly. John yes, Lennon, exactly. John Lennon would, uh, that's right. Uh, would sing. Yes. But I 
think people put their, you know, all of their hopes that Mueller, of course, how can he not come out with, with, you know, with, uh, 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 something that should, that, that, that proves Trump's guilt. And, um, and when he didn't, you know, it was just immediately assumed, well, he didn't, therefore he cleared Trump. He did not clear Trump. No. He did not, you know, it, he charged many people, you know, um, in, the, in the campaign. And, you know, he said that, that, that in many instances, there was just not no evidence that they were able to turn up that, you know, that would prove the things that he was investigating. But when he testified, after his report was was written, he was actually asked that question about clearing Trump, and 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 he said no, right? You know that that that, he, that he's not cleared, and you know that that's a very lengthy report. Most of you know the people who are discussing it or who discuss it have never read it, don't have any idea what's in it. I don't blame them because it's a lot to read. Right. But um, and and again, you had the president and all his cronies saying no collusion. No, you know, you know, whatever there and Bill Barr totally misrepresenting what was in the report. And that's what they ran with. This goes along with the gaslighting of America. It doesn't matter what the report actually said. What they're telling you it said is not what it said at all. But that's the narrative they run with. And that's their truth today. Exactly. And, and, and it brings me back to, you know, these records, mm-hmm. right? And it's why these records are so important. That's right. You know, and it's why the public, like, I am trying to, you know, beyond just writing the story about it, but share the records with people so they can see for themselves what the documents say, what, you know, what, what was being said at the time, what was being discussed why there was, you know, investigative interest in, uh, in, in the campaign's activities as it related to Russia. Um, I'm not saying that, there, that there's, you know, all the answers are mm-hmm. there, but you can get, at least get to, you know, get to see this and gain a better understanding um, of what was happening. And frankly, it is kind of, you know, uh, it's odd. <laughs> I mean, when you read an email from Roger Stone that said in August of 2016, you know, that says, uh, uh, I, I know how to win this. Right. But it ain't pretty. Right. Um, y- yeah. You, you got to go. OK, what does that mean? And what yeah. where what followed that? And that's what you're able to produce for us. Right. Right. So, um, yes. So it, so it's. You know, it's interesting that that it will that will continue getting these records and that it will continue to. Um, I, I'm glad that people are still, you know, interested. I'm certainly fascinated by it, and as I mentioned, I think it's very newsworthy. But I think it will um, continue to add to the narrative, um, and and hopefully expand upon the narrative that um, you know that you know that Mueller kind of left us with, and and go way way beyond beyond that. Gotcha. Hey, Jason Leopold, have all your FOIA stuff given you any insight on what that raid last week might have turned up uh, from Rudy Giuliani's apartment or office? It has not. No. And, you know, I do have some records that I am uh, try- that I that I asked for last year related to, you know, Giuliani's uh, dealings in 2019. Um, it's very interesting. I, we spoke about this, uh, you know, the, the criminal referral that was filed um, uh, against Trump uh, after the whistleblower stepped forward to detail his, you know, his uh, phone, the, this phone call that he had, um, you know, with the president of Ukraine. Right. Um, I, I mean, there's, you know, there's connections to all of that. So I'm yeah. hoping that, you know, there's some more records that, you know, that will um, we'll be able to shake loose where we can, you know, kind of find out what was uh, what was taking place. And I and, and, you know, part of my reporting, in addition to, you know, trying to kind of set the stage for uh, getting records about the Capitol riots mm-hmm. is to also, you know, take a take a look back at uh, about the, the sort of um, 
the damage that was that that may have been done. And there was a lot of it that yes. was done, you know, what that the Trump administration did for four years. Or, oh, or, yeah. You know, what took place for four years that unfolded during the, their their tenure in office. And so there's, uh, you know, kind of assessments that, you know, you want to make. And that's what I'm hoping, you know, some of these records will, you know, will help us um, understand, you know, better what what happened behind the scenes at various government agencies. Like, for example, right now, I'm, you know, housing and urban development, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for, <laughs> you know, some records there. On what Ben Carson did? <laughs> yes. You know, so mm-hmm. um it's, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot that we don't know. And right. so, again, I'm just returning to these, you know, these documents yesterday when I looked at it and, and I had been reporting it pretty extensively on the Mueller investigation. Yeah. When I looked at these records. I'm like, wow, I, I haven't seen this before. This is this is crazy. This is incredible. And and, um, you know, and, and what does it all mean? And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, we can continue putting it out there. I hope not so. Forgetting that, not forgetting that there's a, you know, Joe Biden's in office. Uh-huh. There's going to be, you know, much needed scrutiny on, you know, on uh, on his administration. And, you know, we're certainly doing that. And I'm certainly doing that as well. Um, but I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Of so. course you can. So and, and the reason I asked about the Rudy thing, um, just so you know, the interest in this story and what what happened and what's going on is very far reaching. I, I you'll yeah. appreciate this more than probably anyone else. But the other day, a few days ago, somebody uh, Lucifer on, on Twitter tweeted out, "Has Dollar Store Nosferatu, excuse me, Rudy, been arrested?" And I I answered. I said, "Not yet, but soon." That tweet was liked by Perry Farrell. Oh my God! No way! <laughs> yes. No way! I thought you'd appreciate. It. I'm like, what, Perry Farrell? What? And I click wow. on it, and sure enough, um, he doesn't follow me, but yeah. he liked my tweet. Wow! Isn't that wild? That's amazing, Perry Farrell. Wow! For, for those who don't know, uh, porno for pyros, um, uh, uh, Jane's addiction, right? Perry wow. Farrell, so rock star. Yeah. Yeah, well, out of the blue, uh, who knew? <laughs> yeah that's amazing wow yeah exactly who knew i right. think that's funny yeah so and i thought oh it's got to be a fake twitter account no it's him yeah it yeah doesn't but i followed him he doesn't follow me but yes. anyway so there's that yeah. and there you are wearing your cure t-shirt and today you're yes. getting your second vaccine thank god i'm okay. very excited about it uh feels like a game changer yes I had mine uh, actually probably a month ago now. I was able to get in fairly early, uh, being under wow. 65. And uh, the day I hit two weeks after my second shot, I went and saw my kid and hugged her for the first time yeah. in, you know, 10 oh. months or something. Oh, so, yeah, oh. that's been the hardest part of this. Yeah. yeah. You know, and not being able to travel. And, and I still... Uh, it still probably is going to be a while before I get on a plane. How are you feeling about how everything's going out there? I mean, it's, it's you know, in L.A., it's, it, thank thank goodness we're in a much better position now. Um, but it's been challenging. I mean, it's certainly been challenging as a reporter doing this work from home for uh, more than a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my son um, uh, is 13, so he lives with us, so I do get to hug him. Yes. I miss he's 13? Oh my God. 13. He's, well, I, did I say he was 13? He's going to be 13. Okay. He's well, not 13 yet. I don't want to. You know, <laughs> he's almost 13. Yeah. And my kid almost just turned 22 yesterday. Who? Amazing. You met her. She must have been, I think, 10, yeah. maybe, when yeah. you met her was, when we were out in LA. He was still, he was still little. Yeah. Um, but I miss live music. And, uh, you know, I would go to at least two concerts a month. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I'm hoping that uh, I don't know. There's there's some live music I can see down the road soon. Yeah, well that that's another issue that I want to get into because there was this Save Our Venues organization yeah. that I know David Dan wrote about that was you know it was launched and then I think nothing happened with it. So I don't know where that is, and I may have to get him back on the show to talk about that yeah. uh, to, specifically. I haven't seen, I haven't seen any. Kind of update on that. I mean, I used to get these. I'm on the mailing list for the Troubadour, uh-huh. and they would send these, you know, um, updates regularly. But I haven't seen anything, and I haven't, at least in LA, I haven't heard of any of the, 
you know, more historic venues being shut down. Right. Um, which is a good thing. Yes. But it's very interesting. I, I, um, a friend of mine who's a musician is so anti, anti save our venues. Really? And at least in LA. And one of the reasons is because, you know, he, he, he explained to me as a musician, he goes and, and plays live. You know, he would play at, at these, at these clubs quite a bit. And in LA, there's still sort of the pay to play. Uh, uh-huh. Right. So, you know, if you're an artist, you have to go in and guarantee that you're going to bring sell so many tickets, people, right? And they give you, you end up leaving with, you know, fifty bucks, and the venue, you know, gets the bulk of everything. So right. there's a lot of animosity. Hmm. And I thought it was interesting between some of the artists, or, or many artists in LA, part, you know, local artists and the venues, because there is there hasn't been the same love. That, you know, there. Right. So, right. Oh, that anyway. is interesting. And, and yeah. I've been out of the music end of the business for so long, but I still talk to a lot of my musician friends who are all so many of them were doing, you know, live streams on a right. weekly basis or whatever. Yeah. Many still are. I think Jonathan Brooks still is. I know Dan Navarro is just has hit the road again. He's got a van and wow. he just went out, but he was doing a daily live Facebook session every oh, wow. day. Um Amazing. But they're having to rewrite the rules. And I did see someone uh, from the music business posted a wonderful sort of a, a primer when, when things start opening up again. And, and yeah. as it, just advice, you know, go to shows, go out and see them. Do not ask for comps. I don't care who you are, <laughs> where you are. No comps. Don't ask, right. <laughs> you yeah. know, because they're all hurting right now. Yeah. So I just hope all these venues reopen and that you know, live music starts again. This is, this is what I've done in the past year, like in supporting artists. Uh huh. <laughs> I have been purchasing t-shirts ah! of band t-shirts. <laughs> oh my goodness. I haven't been worn, but like, I don't, I, I can't, I, I think I must've purchased like, another 300 t-shirts oh my for those who don't know jason leopold probably has the biggest band t-shirt collection of all time i do have you do you wear anything other than band t-shirts only when i have to nicole (laughs) (laughs) i hear you all right jason leopold i'm gonna let you go i know you got to go get your shot and um we're running out of time Uh, so great to talk to you i can't wait to see you in person again and i guess we're getting closer Yes, yes. I, I hope that we do get to see each other in person, and it's always great. Yes. Always good to see you and chat with you. You too, and congratulations again on another scoop. I was so thrilled. Look, I was looking forward to just, you know, talking to you about yeah, stuff, and then I wake up, it's like... We have something. Yeah, oh, wow. Okay, Jason's got a huge yeah. story today. Perfect timing. Yeah. So, it works. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Oh, Jason Leopold, one of the really good guys. I, I You know, I met, I met Jason simply by really doing this show um, probably, what, 12, 13, 14 years ago? Maybe it was when I was on Air America. Um, and we just, we struck up a friendship because he is, he's just what you hear. And he's a music lover and we, we bonded over music and, you know, and uh, yeah, he's, he's just, he's one of the good guys. And so it's so great to see him enjoying a wonderful success. And uh, I, I'm only sorry that I didn't get to talk to him, that I didn't see the story about this Judge Berman ordering the Justice Department to release uh, these documents in which the, the, the Trump DOJ basically lied, cleared Trump of any wrongdoing, and that was not uh, the right move. So somebody... Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, Randy Lover in the chat room at NicoleSandler.com listen live page wrote, it looks like justice got put on hold for the Trump administration and is starting back up. Well, let's hope so. Unfortunately, we're still stuck with, you know, uh, so many remnants of of that administration. And of course, Trump's insanity and his gaslighting. The whole, I, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to start calling Everybody talking about, you know, the big lie as the big lie it is so typical of the crap he does. Somebody should write a book about that, about this, the mental manipulation, the gaslighting that uh, he excels at. That's what Trump is good at, at, at taking fact and skewing it and twisting it and 
and making people believe the lies. I mean, this is like the Pied Piper with, you know, with all these idiots following him to, I guess, the rapture. Isn't that what they want? Um, Let me uh, close out the show with some more Florida news, because I I think I told you a little bit about this yesterday. It was happening just as the show was ending. But Florida Governor Ron Moron death sentence strikes again. Yesterday, he he said that he was going to do away with all uh, COVID-19 emergency mandates as of July 1st. Right. So he signed is signing legislation. Uh, you know, a bill into law saying that as of July 1st, no more anything. We're, we're, we're free and clear, which we are not, but this is what death sentence is saying. And because the law wouldn't take effect until July 1st, he's going to sign an executive order making it happen immediately. Let it be so. Isn't that the, the Star Trek thing? Make it so? Make it so. Anyway, um, oh, I guess I shouldn't talk about Star Trek on the uh, May the 4th, because today uh, is only Star Wars time, right? I should, le- I should, I should play Shirley, Shirley Sherbon, who, you know, is one of the wonderful artists that I discovered uh, during the pandemic, who makes these great song parodies. She did one. <laughs> and I, 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 I struggled with, should I play this or not? Because it's... Um, it's funny, but it's weird. It's it's a Star Trek song. Anyway, we'll see if I have time. But anyway, so Ron DeSantis is now saying, as of, you know, immediately, no masks, no nothing. Well, just so you know, you can push back. South Florida schools all said, uh, screw you, DeSantis. I don't care what you say. We are going to uh, mandate that masks be worn. Um you know, at our schools, we will open up, but yeah, you got to wear a mask. And Disney World and Disneyland, well, but Disney World is what we have in Florida, is saying, uh, whatever you say, it doesn't matter. Masks are still mandated here at Disney World, too. All right, so we got that going for us. And hopefully the American people will see through him. By the way, Charlie Crist, who is the former governor of, of Florida, who was a Republican, but sort of acted like a Democrat, now is a Democrat, who kind of acts like a Republican. Anyway, he he decided he's running for um, he's he's running for um, the Senate. He's going to challenge Marco Rubio. Go for it. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a, uh, a DeSantis. I mean, a, a Charlie Crist fan, but he's better than DeSantis. All right. I think I should leave you with this because it is um, uh, May the 4th. And so um, <laughs> we'll leave you with Shirley Sherbon's, what did she call it? May the 4th be with you for 4th May Star Wars Day. Um, yeah, that's what it is. So um, um, uh, I guess sing it, Shirley. Oh, I got to fix the screen. All right. We'll, we'll do it. I'll do it uh, like this. Take it away, Hi, Shirley. Shirley. Sherbon, may the fourth be with you. In our galaxy, life has been crappy in 2020 and 21. Today we look at things brightly. Now may the fourth be with everyone. Disturbance amongst the force. The Darth virus has brought the Death Star. We're doomed. The dark side is strong. It's kept everyone indoors. May the force be with you now. We will press on. <laughs> All right, this is weird. Now may the force be making us hardy. We've had it harshly, but we're not done. to us and if you're feeling sick today please stay in your bed and keep away get a jab play your heart 
do or do not, there is no try. Jedi, May the Fourth is here. That's why we take heart. We take heart. Live long and prosper. Huh? <laughs> Wrong franchise. <laughs> May the 4th be with you! Woohoo! <laughs> May the 4th be with you, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Bye. Ah! All right, I did have it here. Um, what happened to it? Oh, my news just... Oh, there it is. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Let's begin today with some good news. Daily U.S. COVID-19 cases and death totals are now about one-fifth of what they were during their winter peaks. Many experts attribute some of the slowdown to climbing vaccine numbers. Nearly 83% of Americans 65 and older have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose, and nearly 70% are fully vaccinated. Now the push is on to get younger people vaccinated too. So the FDA is ready to authorize the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 12 to 15 by early next week. Now for the bad news. The United States will likely never reach herd immunity. Mm -mm. Experts once thought the U.S. would be able to reach the threshold for herd immunity when 60 to 70 percent of the population had immunity to the virus. But now they estimate that reaching 80 percent or more might be required, this due to the more transmissible B117 variant. But that level is probably out of reach, partly due to vaccine hesitancy. But we know that vaccines can help turn the virus into a milder threat that could be more like the seasonal flu. Watch for the Biden administration to pivot to younger people to get those hesitant to the vaccine to get inoculated. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is having mixed results. In Brazil, COVID-19 has caused one out of every three deaths this year, and less than 10 percent of the Brazilian population has been vaccinated so far. And the situation in India is beyond dire. President Biden will raise the refugee cap to 62,500 people this fiscal year after pretty intense backlash following his earlier decision to maintain the Trump era cap of 15,000. The elevated limit gets the administration back on track to its February promise of admitting more refugees. Biden temporarily went back on his initial goal when a surge of migrants at the southern border moved him to reevaluate the policies. Nearly 6,000 undocumented immigrants were apprehended at the border daily in April. Preliminary government data shows that means the continued influx is still higher than normal, but it appears to have plateaued. The Biden administration says it's still focusing on moving families and children out of U.S. Border Patrol custody as fast as possible to alleviate overcrowding and long stays. And there is some progress being made. Four families that were separated at the Mexican border during Trump's presidency will be reunited this week as just the beginning of a broader effort. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said more than 5,500 children were separated from their parents during the Trump administration going back to July of 2017. Reportedly, some 1,000 families are still apart thanks to the policies of the previous administration. Remember the name Richard Cordray? No, not from The Daily Show. Richard Cordray, the former Ohio Attorney General and head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Well, President Biden has tapped him to head the office charged with overseeing the federal government's student loan portfolio of more than a trillion dollars. Cordray will be a high profile leader for an obscure but important agency that could play a central role in the debate over canceling student loan debt. Andrew Brown Jr. was laid to rest Monday in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, where he was shot and killed by police serving search and arrest warrants two weeks ago. Last week, a judge ruled against releasing all of the body cam videos showing the shooting and the events leading up to it. Tensions are flaring over the lack of transparency. An independent autopsy done for the family found that Brown was shot five times, including once in the back of the head. He was unarmed. 
Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said Monday that he was issuing an executive order barring local governments in the state from imposing any COVID-19 emergency mandates beginning July 1st. DeSantis said that with the vaccine supply now outstripping demand, there was no need to continue the restrictions. DeSantis announced the executive order as he signed a bill passed by the state's Republican-controlled legislature barring private businesses and other entities from requiring vaccine passports. DeSantis said the moves were, quote, the evidence-based thing to do, adding that they would help people, quote, enjoy themselves and, quote, live freely in the state of Florida. Well, not so fast, buddy. As with just about everything this governor does, he seems to have acted before thinking it through. The Orlando Sentinel reported yesterday, quote, over 10,000 cases of COVID-19 variants of concern have been reported in Florida, more than double the total just two weeks earlier, and an indication that the spread is accelerating. Through May 1st, nearly 500 of those cases have been reported in Orange County, nearly 200 in Osceola, 188 in Seminole, and 130 in Lake. By far, the most common variant was the B117, the strain first detected in the UK. It was reported in 9,050 cases statewide. It's estimated to be 60% more infectious than the original dominant strain of COVID-19. It's also believed to result in more severe illness and higher hospitalization rates. The most recent estimate is that it's 67% more deadly. And Ron DeSantis is doing away with all emergency orders to protect Floridians from COVID infection? Lovely. Now you know why I call it Florida and why I refer to Governor DeSantis as Governor Death Sentence. Bill and Melinda Gates announced Monday that after 27 years of marriage, they're getting a divorce. Bill Gates, of course, co-founded Microsoft and long served as the software giant CEO. He owns about 1.4% of the company's shares. That stake is worth more than $26 billion. The couple released a statement saying that they will continue to work together at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that they share a belief in the mission, but no longer believe they can grow together as a couple. And finally, just when he thought the dossier was dead, we find out there's another one. In the UK, The Telegraph reported Monday night that M16 spy Christopher Steele produced a second dossier on Donald Trump for the FBI. This one, while Trump was in the White House. Steele reportedly filed a series of intelligence reports to United States authorities during Trump's tenure, including information concerning alleged sexual exploits. The intelligence gathered in this second dossier reportedly includes further details of Paul Manafort's alleged Russian contacts. To be continued, I'm sure. I got the news. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com and please click on that donate button. 